What exactly is Project Butterfly? Is Vigilante as crazy as he acts? And how did Peacemaker survive the events of the Suicide Squad? Here's a quick explainer about where the first three episodes of Peacemaker leave our patriotic hero. Hey, the, the reason I'm excited it is normal. Uh if you didn't catch his appearance in The Suicide Squad when it premiered last summer, Peacemaker helpfully brings you up to speed by showcasing exactly what the title character's all about. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. What else do you need to know? After the battle against Starro the Conqueror in Corto Maltese, Peacemaker is more or less right as rain despite getting shot in the throat and getting a building dropped on him. You're shot and a building falls on you. And all you have to replace is a clavicle? You're the luckiest man alive. After getting recaptured shortly after leaving the hospital, Peacemaker's once again back working for the government. Though Amanda Waller's not his commanding officer this time. Peacemaker's new boss is Clemson Mann, a mercenary with a dark reputation. But it's not all new in Peacemaker. The first hour of the series brings a number of familiar faces back from Task Force X including Amelia Harcourt, Johnny Carnamos, and briefly a cameo from Amanda Waller herself. We also meet a new member of the team, Leota Adebayo, Peacemaker's racist father, Argy Smith, and Peacemaker's best human friend slash biggest fan, Vigilante. Let's take a look where they all end up in the first three episodes of Peacemaker. After following Harcourt to a bar, Peacemaker makes a series of passes at his co-worker, none of which work out. Though Peacemaker is immediately attracted to Harcourt, he becomes even more smitten when she violently takes down a man who attacks her. Harcourt later gives Peacemaker a piece of her mind. Not that he totally gets what she has to say. I have no interest in you other than your ability to fight for us. Just because you're handsome doesn't mean you're not a piece of sh murderer. Think I'm handsome? When Peacemaker begs for a no-strings-attached deal between the two of them, Harcourt appears to grow even less interested and leaves. While Peacemaker spends a significant amount of time in the first episode focusing on sex, Harcourt appears laser-focused on the finer details of her new job. She sees her placement on this specific task force as punishment for her participation in the mutiny against Amanda Waller and the Suicide Squad and wants to prove herself all over again. As Waller herself later says, Barbie's ambitious, watch out for her. Somewhat surprisingly, Viola Davis has a short cameo in the first episode as Amanda Waller. She appears in a short video call with Leota, who, in addition to working as Waller's eyes and ears on this mission, also happens to be her daughter. In keeping with her usual MO, Waller is once again playing a game outside the bounds of the stated mission. During her FaceTime call with Leota, Waller commands her to hide a forged diary in Peacemaker's trailer, for reasons that are initially known only to her. The exact purpose of the diary may not be made immediately clear, but given the crying child on the cover, it's likely to paint a less than flattering picture of Peacemaker's inner psyche. But to what end? While Amanda Waller's exact plan in the Peacemaker series remains unclear in the first three episodes, it seems certain that Waller will seek to double-cross Peacemaker and the rest of the team eventually. Leota is not the only character in Peacemaker with an interesting parent who is difficult to deal with. Terminator 2 star Robert Patrick plays Peacemaker's appallingly racist father, Argy. When Peacemaker first arrives at his dad's home, his dad is visibly displeased to see him. While Argy is briefly amused at the story of Bloodsport's childhood trauma, his main response to his son's war stories is rooted in disappointment. At his son's insistence, Argy gives him another Peacemaker-branded helmet. As it turns out, Peacemaker's new helmet ends up coming his way at just the right time. After getting rejected by Harcourt, Peacemaker goes home with Annie, a random woman at the bar. Unfortunately, as a casual encounter is on the cusp of wrapping up, that same woman seems to go completely feral, stabbing Peacemaker and throwing him through a wall. It isn't until Peacemaker is reunited with his helmet that he is able to gain the upper hand by activating a new feature, the Sonic Boom. Considering how effective Argy's helmet tech seems to be in this first episode, we can't help but wonder if these other helmets will be utilized at some other point this season. The other power-up options in the lab offer features as varied as a full-body force field, an underwater breathing apparatus, and X-ray vision tech. In a post-credit sequence, Argy even shows Peacemaker a helmet that literally just infects its wearer with scabies, just because. I just want to give you scabies. Give me scabies? Why would I want scabies? Challenge yourself. Every man should have scabies once in his life. 
The motivations for Annie Sturphausen's attack on Peacemaker in the first episode aren't entirely clear to the team at first. Mern notes that the entire operation has been kept off the books, and he can't understand how anyone could have known that Peacemaker was a part of it. Harcourt suggests that Amanda Waller might have been behind it. After Leota insists that it's not Waller, Harcourt even begins to question Leota's placement on the mission. Eventually, however, Peacemaker remembers that he caught Annie reviewing the classified materials provided to him by Mern including a dossier detailing the mission to assassinate a sitting U.S. senator. While Harcourt has proven wrong in her initial accusations against Leota, this specific encounter has clearly raised her suspicions of her newest colleague. We can't imagine that Harcourt or any of the other team members will react positively when they find out that Waller and Leota are keeping an important part of the mission plan a secret. We can't call it entirely shocking to discover that Peacemaker's father is a character like White Dragon. Argy Smith isn't exactly excited to see his son return home, and he's quickly revealed to be a vile homophobe and racist. Now that Argy finds himself in prison after Johnny Kimonos frames him for Peacemaker's crimes, he is shown to command a vast number of fiercely loyal white supremacist followers. In some ways, this is a fitting adaptation from the Peacemaker comic book series in which Peacemaker's father, Wolfgang Schmidt, is a former commandant of a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. Since the last concentration camp was liberated by the Allies in May of 1945, and Peacemaker is set in the present day, the math wouldn't quite allow for the same origin story without some changes. In the comics, William Heller, aka White Dragon, is unrelated to Peacemaker. But considering the comic character's white supremacist motivations and appearances in the Suicide Squad comic books, this new configuration turns out to be a natural fit. Peacemaker is definitely one of those characters who just seems to stumble into earth-shattering revelations. After a long set of failures, Vigilante convinces Peacemaker to let loose by celebrating his release from prison with a mixture of controlled substances, firearms, and explosives. However, the day's festivities don't stop Peacemaker from mistakenly learning more about his upcoming mission. While smoking marijuana with Vigilante and Amber, Peacemaker starts fiddling around with the alien-looking device he stole from Annie's house. When Peacemaker touches a button on the device, it quickly expands and forms what appears to be a tiny spaceship. By the time the second episode wraps up, it's unclear who or what purpose such a small vessel could serve. But it has to be tied to Project Butterfly somehow. Episode 3 puts the deadly capabilities of Vigilante on display for the first time. Following Peacemaker's inability to pull the trigger at the home of Senator Roiland Goff, Vigilante takes control of the mission by executing three of the four targets. After Peacemaker and Vigilante are captured by Goff, Vigilante is unmasked and tortured. Unfortunately for Vigilante, Peacemaker refuses to give up any information, even going so far as to tell Goff to basically do his worst, torture-wise. Does yeah. that change your mind? Sorry, pal. Not for sale. <laughs> What? Give it all you got! Vigilante is visibly shocked when Peacemaker refuses to spare him any torture and appears genuinely hurt at Peacemaker's lack of empathy for him. Given Peacemaker's prior actions, what could possibly make Vigilante surprised by Peacemaker's unflinching response? Maybe Vigilante really is as delusional as he seemed to be. Still, even if Vigilante is Peacemaker's number one fan, losing part of a pinky toe is bound to drive a wedge into even the hardiest of friendships. It doesn't seem like these two would-be superheroes are quite that close to begin with. Dude, I'm your best friend. I know it. To quote Ned Leeds of Spider-Man Homecoming, most people would probably agree that John Econ Emos seems like an archetypal guy in the chair. Hey, can I be your guy in the chair? What? You know how there's a guy with a headset? telling the other guy where to go? However, Episode 3 forces Economos to quite literally jump out of his chair and face the threat directly. As Harcourt, Leota, and Mern move in on the house where Peacemaker and Vigilante are held hostage by a butterfly, Economos realizes that Judo Master is escaping the scene in a vehicle. John ultimately rises to the occasion, crashing the team's van directly into Judo Master's car and later pummeling the martial artist with a tire iron. That might be a big win for John's ego, but the bigger question is where Judo Master was driving to. Before Goff starts to torture Vigilante for answers, he tells Judo Master, Take the tunnel to the forest. From there, get to Glen Ty, let them know what's occurred here. Yes. Presumably, there are other butterflies, maybe even more important ones than the Senator. Once they find out about Peacemaker's mission, how are they going to react? After Peacemaker gains the upper hand against Senator Goff, he fires a single shotgun blast into Goff's face. And that's that, right? In most cases, this would mean the end of Goff's character, but not on Peacemaker. As Peacemaker and Vigilante prepare to reunite with the rest of the team upstairs, the two notice a small creature crawling out of the face of the late Senator. 
As the creature takes to the sky with a flapping of its wings, Peacemaker knowingly remarks, Oh, Project Butterfly. That's when the episode ends with a tease that suspected butterflies are all over the world. Episode 3's reveal of the literal butterfly inside Senator Goff's head is a major clue to the entire mission at large, a subject about which Peacemaker actually knows frighteningly little. Is the goal to kill all butterflies, or just the ones that Amanda Waller wants dead? When Peacemaker gives mum intel that proves that the seemingly happy family of four is actually entirely composed of butterflies, the task force captain quickly relays orders to kill them all. Does this mean all butterflies are as dangerous as a woman who attacks Peacemaker in Episode 1? Considering the fact that we've only seen them attack Peacemaker either in self-defense or after discovering his assassination plan, they might not even be malevolent. Regardless, given everything we've learned about the group so far, it seems fairly obvious that literally anyone, even people we think we know, could secretly be a butterfly. Many of the post credit scenes in Peacemaker work as jokey extensions of scenes from the episode, rather than material that's critical to the plot. Episode 3's post credit sequence takes us back to the moment when Vigilante reveals himself behind the bushes outside the home of Senator Garth. As Harcourt prepares for the possibility that Vigilante could ruin the entire mission, she issues a menacing threat. If you f up this mission, I will kill your f family. <laughs> okay, good luck. A little late for that. You guys got beer? Considering this character's particular proclivity for violence, it doesn't seem like a big stretch to guess that Vigilante might even be the one responsible for his family's deaths. In the Vigilante comic series, Adrian Chase takes on the Vigilante persona after his wife and children are murdered by the mob. While it's possible this series is simply alluding to the original character's comic history, we think it's more likely this character has an intensely more absurd background. In Episode 2, Vigilante admits to Peacemaker that, in prior years, he would have killed him for smoking marijuana. And he seems similarly extreme in his response to other crimes. When I find out someone murdered an innocent person, or sold somebody heroin, or did some graffiti, and I kill that person. Perhaps Vigilante's family members simply chose a bad time to jaywalk? Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.